All right, well, we've turned over two o'clock on the hour. So let's go ahead and get started. Welcome everybody to the Mylia Photos Coffee Break. I'm Angela Andrew. And today we're gonna to be talking about visual properties, which is one of the new sections in Quick Filters that has a lot of power to it. So without any further ado, let me jump in and share my screen and we will get started. So up here on the screen, you've got my Mylia library. And I'm gonna go ahead and just close off this right column here. So you can take in the grid view and then over here on the left, I have quick filters open. If you're not seeing this panel, you can just open it here by clicking open the sidebar or clicking on the little funnel icon here in the lower left. And that's gonna open quick filters. And that works on a tablet as well. And those icons are the same on a phone. So all of these options are available no matter what device you're using. And the areas that we wanna zoom, zoom in on today and take a closer look at because we've looked at quick filters and quick collections a lot already in several other coffee breaks, but there's a new section right here called visual properties that I wanna acquaint you with because there's a lot of power in there and you may not use all of those tools and that's perfectly fine, but I want you to know they're there and what they do. We also have some additional uh, visual properties up here under smart tags. And we'll talk a little bit about what makes these different from these down here. So the first thing I wanna do is narrow down my library so we can look at a specific grouping of images. So that way we're not looking at all, you know, 105,000 or 110,000, however many there are in my library at this point. So I'm gonna go ahead and filter this by a specific folder. So I'm gonna go down and click into by folder, go into my main archive here and scroll down to 2023. And I'm gonna go to, let's choose this date here. I'm gonna pin that so it stays persistent at the top. And these are some pictures from a road trip that I took with my mom last week. We had a great time exploring the Oregon coast. And I wanna use these images to show you a little bit about how you can use these visual property filters inside Mylio Photos. So let's go ahead, I'm gonna scroll back up here and collapse down the by folder category. And we're gonna talk a little bit about the differences between the visual properties under smart tags and the ones that are down here under their own category. So you might be wondering, why do we have two different visual properties sections? Well, the reason is because these ones here up under smart tags, these are AI generated. So if you remember, all of our smart tags use computer vision to take a look at the contents of your photo. And this all happens on your computer, on your device, locally, it's not being sent out to the cloud, so everything's private. But this is looking at what's in your picture to determine these visual properties. These ones down here, these relate to the metadata that are actually embedded in your photos or the physical characteristics of them, like their size, their aspect ratio, and so forth. So both of these are similar, but they work slightly differently. So let's take a look here first at the smart tags visual properties. And I'm going to go ahead and expand this down. And you'll see we have a handful of options here that are really, really powerful. So I'm going to go ahead and click on blurry, and I want to see if I can find any blurry photos in this collection. And what do you know? I had a couple of pictures here. I was out photographing first thing in the morning, some flying cormorants. And if I go ahead and zoom in on these pictures, I can take a look and see if they're actually sharp. So this one here, even though he's far away, he's pretty sharp, but this guy here is definitely blurry. So using this blurry smart tag, it allows me to go through and find things that are maybe worth not keeping. So for right now, I'm going to go ahead and hit this picture with an X on my keyboard. This is going to mark it as a reject. So that way I know later on that this is one that's a candidate to be deleted. I'm not ready to delete it quite yet, but marking it as a reject lets me know that this is probably one I don't need to do anything else with. We also have the option to find things with a shallow depth of field. So if you like that beautiful creamy bouquet in the background, let's go ahead and click on that. And that's going to find images that have that nice creamy, dreamy background. And I love this particular smart tag because when I'm going out and shooting things like wildflowers or even setting up a macro photo shoot in my own house, I love to get this beautiful soft background and using this bouquet filter, this quick filter here, lets me find those images that probably have this soft, dreamy look. Now we also have the ability to use the color smart tags. And this lets you go through and find things that fit into different colors in this group of images. So I'm going to turn off the bouquet and let's go ahead and take a look and find things that are blue. And I'm going to hit the G key on my keyboard and go back to the grid. And you can see that all of these images are all very strongly 
um, blue in color. And you can adjust this by going into this gear and saying you want it to be more accurate or less accurate. That's completely up to you. And this lets you kind of group things together and find things that make a cohesive look. So if you're putting together a slideshow, or maybe you're trying to print out some pictures that you want to put up on the wall in your house, or maybe you even have a gallery show where you're sharing some of your best work and you want to find things that have a cohesive look and feel, using color is a great way to do that. So you can go through, find your best images, then filter by the color, and that's going to allow you to put together a collection of things that really go nicely together. So this is how you can use color. And then down here we have exposure, which this is really helpful if maybe your camera metered off of the wrong object or the wrong source of light in a picture, and it turned out way too dark or way too bright. And this is a quick and easy way to find those. So let's go ahead and click on overexposed, and you'll see that all of these images are really quite bright. Now, for me, I might not want to get rid of these because one of the techniques I use in my photography is called bracketing. I use exposure bracketing to capture a middle exposure, a darker exposure, and a brighter exposure. I can then use software to merge them together. So these are not necessarily mistakes, but if I'm just going through and taking pictures and not really paying close attention and I'm doing single exposures and they're too bright, this is a great way to find those images that are maybe not keepers. And again, I can do the same thing with underexposed and find all of the ones that are very dark. And for instance, I can look at this one here and go, well, I was going for a silhouette look and I wanted to expose for the sky. So this one is worth keeping. It's not, it may be technically underexposed, but it's the look I was going for. So even though AI is very helpful in finding these things, you still have to use your own artistic judgment as to what's worth keeping and what's not. But these tools can be very helpful in helping you kind of whittle down the options to see what's good and what might not be. So any questions on those so far? So we've got a couple of comments here in the chat. Take a look here. All right, all good. So moving on, outside of visual properties, there's a couple of other things here in smart tags that you probably want to be aware of. They work very similarly to those visual properties, and that's under person. And this is where we can find things with eyes open, eyes closed, not smiling, smiling. If you're going through a set of portraits, pictures of your kids, your grandkids, your friends, your family, these are a great way to find those best pictures really, really quickly so you can share them. I'm not gonna go ahead and click through them right now because this particular collection of images doesn't have any photos of people. I was really focused in on photographing the landscape and this particular folder only has things for my big camera. Now I have plenty of pictures of my mom and me on this trip on my, my cell phone, but those are in a different folder. So we're not gonna see those in this particular collection. All right, so that's smart tags and the visual properties inside of smart tags. Let's go ahead and jump down to by visual property. And this is a section that was really heavily influenced by Matthew Jordan Smith. He is an incredibly well-known photographer who has photographed many, many famous people. He's done some amazing art and he's actually gonna be a guest at a webinar with us here with Mylio on Friday. And I believe Lori put the link for that into the chat. So if you're able to join us, I do highly encourage you to be there. He's going to be talking a lot about one of his latest projects, which I think is going to be fascinating. But it was with his input that we crafted this visual property section. So I'm going to say up front that there's a lot here that the average person was, is going to like. And then there's going to be a lot here that if you're a professional photographer, is going to make you very, very happy. Some of these things, if you're just a casual shooter photographing your kids, your grandkids, your family, things around you that interest you, but you're not necessarily a quote unquote photographer, then maybe some of these might not be of interest to you. The beauty of Mylio Photos is that even though there's so many options and it's such a big program, you don't have to use everything. So if some of these don't apply to you, you just don't use them, but some of these might actually really get you excited. So let's jump into them and go over what they do. So I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna turn off that underexposed AI tag hit the G key on my keyboard to go back to my grid. And let's take a look at this. So by the first one here we have is by edited. And this simply means that you can click in here and you can find all of your pictures that are not edited or edited. So let's go ahead and choose edited. And this is gonna bring up the pictures that I edited in my Leo photos. If you're using an external editor, those will not show here. But if you've done edits in my Leo, this is where you're gonna find them. And this is a really quick and easy way to get to the pictures that are the best that you've already edited or 
to use as a to-do list for things that you might still need to work on. All right, so let's go ahead and close that one out. Next, we have by cropped. And again, this is gonna show things that have been cropped inside of Mylio Photos. If you cropped it in another application, Mylio doesn't know that. So let's go ahead and hit cropped here. And you can see there's a few images that I have gone ahead and cropped. And I have several here that are not. And I also have a habit of holding my camera just slightly lopsided. So you can see that many of these could be cropped and rotated. And this is kind of a to-do list of where I can go to improve these photos. All right. The next one here is by orientation. And this one is a lot of fun. And for me, this goes back to, again, curating a collection of images, whether that's to share on social media, to print out, to put in a wall gallery, or whatever you want to use them for, is you can find all of your portrait orientation images or all of your landscape orient orientation images or the squares. Um, I have some panoramas that I took on this trip as well, but those are mostly with my phone. So those aren't going to show here. If I click on that, there's no results. But this is a really cool way to go through and find specifically oriented images that you can then put together and show in a cohesive collection. I really like this particular feature. I think it's very helpful. Uh, similarly, we have by aspect ratio, and this is going to let you see things by specific aspect ratio. So if you like to crop everything to a five by seven, you can click on this and find all of the ones that you've cropped. Um, most cameras are going to be by default a two by three. But you can also see if you go in here and do your one by ones, you're going to find your squares. So it's very similar to my orientation, but it's a little bit more granular. And you, as you see, as you go down this list, it starts to get more technical. The things that are going to be the most commonly used are here at the top. And the things that are going to be less commonly used are going to be down here towards the bottom. So let's go ahead and jump into some of these others. And these are your camera settings. So whether you're using a mirrorless or DSLR camera and shooting manually, or you're using your iPhone, these settings all take place in the background, even if you're shooting on fully automatic. So aperture is the opening that lets light into your camera. And you can go in here and set a threshold for what the aperture is. So a lower number means more light and usually a shallow depth of field. So if you want that kind of blurry background, you're gonna have a low number. If you want more of your scene to be in focus, that's gonna be a higher number. So you can go through here and find images based on that aperture. So this is again, a very technical feature, but it's very, very cool. So, and it also lets you find things based on specific lenses. So I know that most of my lenses are an F4 or smaller. So I can go from an F4 and say, I want to find everything shot from F4 to let's say F8. I can go ahead and pin that. And that's going to give me everything that was shot in that aperture range. I can go ahead and take that out of there. And let's jump down to the next one. ISO is the sensitivity of your sensor to light. Again, it controls how light or dark a picture is. And most cameras, the default is going to be 100. And for a lot of smartphones, some of those can even go down quite a bit lower. But let's say we want to find everything between ISO 100 and ISO 1600. And for most cameras, once you have this number start going higher and higher, it makes the camera absorb more light, but you also have the trade-off of getting that digital noise or that pesky grain that has those little flecks of color throughout your picture. So the higher this number is, the higher the chance that that picture is going to be of lower quality and maybe need a little bit of extra help in post-processing. So you can find things based on those camera settings. And let's say we want to find everything that's up to ISO 1600 or maybe 3200 or even 6400. It depends on your camera. Some cameras perform really, really well, even up to 12,800. Some are gonna be closer down here in the 1600 range before it starts becoming visually um, noticeable and non-desirable. So let's go ahead and click that. And that's gonna show us all the pictures in that particular ISO range. Next on the list, we have our white balance. And this is how your camera interprets the color of light. And the color of light is measured in Kelvins. So we have an actual Kelvin scale here that shows the color temperature. And you can choose a manual range, or you can go down and take a look at the typical presets that you find in your cameras. So for me, I'm usually switching between automatic white balance or daylight white balance. And by clicking on these, it shows the preset that I have that's um, saved in my metadata from when I captured that image. 
And so I can quickly find images that way. This is also great if you have a folder of images that maybe you had that white balance preset incorrect. And you know you have this range of images that all need to be corrected. Let's say you're out shooting in um, cloudy weather, but you had it on daylight. And so you want to find all the ones with daylight so you can then go in and correct those so it looks more natural for a cloudy day. So this is just one more way you can use that white balance. As we go further down the list, you're going to have things that are much more technical, such as exposure bias. I mentioned earlier that I shoot exposure brackets quite frequently. And let's see here, we find an example. Here's an example right here. So here's a, an overexposed version, an underexposed version, and a normal exposed version. So what we can find with exposure bias is things that are, you use that exposure compensation on your camera to make it darker or brighter purposefully. And so I can find those bracketed shots using exposure bias and find things that are, let's say overexposed between one and five stops. So let's go ahead and do that and go back to my grid. I can hit the G key. And these are all of the images that I have plus one to plus five of exposure compensation. And I know from my own shooting style that these are all probably part of brackets that I can use and process if I wanted to. So that's a really cool thing for, especially for those who like to do exposure bracketing to find those particular images. And then you also have bifocal length, which is gonna be the length of your lens. Um, and this is another way that you can use to find things for specific lenses. Uh, you can also go ahead and search by camera and lens if you know specifically what lens you were looking for. Otherwise you can do a range, like for instance, I have a couple of different lenses that overlap in focal length. I have a 24 to 105, and I have a 70 to 200. So I can find things that are by both lenses, but within a particular range, and it'll show things that were captured with all of the lenses that were in within that range. You also have by shutter speed, how fast that shutter is opening and closing, by metering mode, and down here by flash. So I didn't take any flash with me on this trip, and I don't have a built-in flash on my camera. So if I go down here by flash, I'm gonna go ahead and take daylight off of there and I'm gonna remove the exposure bias. If I say flash did not fire, that's gonna show me everything. If I say flash fired, it's gonna show me nothing because I know I took no pictures with a flash. And then you have many other options here and these are very much geared towards studio photographers. So if you don't shoot in a studio, you don't use off-camera strobes, these might not be of interest to you, but if you do, these can be exceptionally helpful. In a studio environment, a lot of times there's a refresh rate between when you fire a strobe or fire a flash, and it takes a second or two for it to refresh before you can fire that flash again. And sometimes your shutter speed is going off and maybe you have a frame in between that's dark. This is a great way to find ones that didn't have the flash fire when it was supposed to. And then you can kind of cull those out and get rid of them as needed. So once we go through and find a particular list of different pills up here. So you can add multiple pills to make very complicated and very thorough filters. You can always go through and save those as a new quick collection. So this way you could build up a list of filters, save it and go back to it whenever you want. It's very quick and easy and can be a super time saver. Um, I think that pretty much covers everything for the visual properties that I wanted to go into today. I know that Matthew is going to show us a lot more on Friday and take it into a much more creative and all-encompassing realm, which I hope you guys are able to attend and will enjoy. But for now, I want to go ahead and open this up and take any questions. Angela Harold had one question that I answered, but maybe you can uh, revisit his question there in the chat. Perfect. So that's a great question, Harold. Does Milio know about edited, cropped, et cetera, when editing and cropping was done outside of Milio? Unfortunately, it does not. So when you bring an image into Mylio Photos, it knows that picture as it is today. It's only gonna show when you choose that edited or by cropped option, if those edits or crops were done inside Mylio Photos. It's not going to filter them out if those changes were done in another application. That's a great question though. All right, any other questions? I don't see any other questions in chat. All right. Well, if anybody wants to unmute and ask any questions, now is your opportunity. Angela, will the camera uh, function, will it pick up a smartphone and the various lenses? So as far as the, the three different, like say an iPhone that has the three different lenses? Yes. 
That's a great question. So I know it'll choose the focal length. It'll get the focal length and then you can go that way. As far as we go down to by camera and by lens, let's go down here to by lens. I don't think it's, well, maybe it does. Let's see, Apple. Wow. So it's got the back camera and the front camera. And we can move this out. I don't know if you, any guys, if you guys realize this, but if this column is too small, you can always grab the handle right here in between and drag it bigger. So yes, it is showing the different cameras that are on each one of my iPhones. Great. That is, that is cool. I didn't know that. Yeah. Good question. <laughs> Excellent. Yes. All right. Keep them coming. What else you guys got? Angela, would there be a way to tag a photo? Let's. I do my developing in Luminar. Mm -hmm. Tag those photos and be able to re-pick those up. What do you mean by re-pick them up? Just to be able to locate them? Yeah, or to have, find, to, to have Luminar find them? I want to, I'm in I'm Luminar and I put them back in the My Leo. I'd like to find all the photos I developed in Luminar. Is there a way to so, tag them as I'm developing them? So one thing you can do is if you're exporting them out of Luminar individually, you can append Luminar Neo or whatever you want to the file name. So this one is an HDR that I did in Neo. Okay. And you can say it added automatically HDR, but when I'm saving it, I could also put, you know, just put Luminar in there. Another option would be to just put a Luminar keyword. A keyword. Mm -hmm. um, or what you could do is everything that you've edited with a certain application, if you have just a few that you work with, you could assign a color label and filter them that way as well. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Hi, Angela. It's Darren here. I just, hey, Darren. just heard, I heard that discussion um what i tend to do uh, when i'm exporting the photo i export it as you mentioned and put a little um i put for example for topaz photo i put dash tp okay that gets added to the file name and then i can follow the structure that i use to edit the photo so if i cropped it first in a different app or if i topaz it secondly and then i luminaire forward it you know as the third item I always put the ones with, with my watermark on the bottom and I use just dash WM so I can go straight to them because I know, but they've, they've got the, <laughs> the suffix of all of the edited um, um, uh, stages that I did. Excellent. That is a fabulous idea. It just helps me later on figure out how I edited a photo. <laughs> oh, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. One thing I do is, I, now not everybody is a Photoshop user and uses layers in Photoshop, but when I do an image that's gone through, let's say I open it in Adobe Camera Raw, and then I open it in Photoshop to do maybe a couple of quick remove things, and then maybe I take it into Luminar or Topaz, I do each one of those changes on a new layer, and I rename that layer whatever tool it is that I used. So that way, if I reopen up that TIFF file that has all of those layers preserved, I can see what I did in each one of those steps. So that's, that's another right. option. Yeah. Can I, just one question. You mentioned TIFF, and I, I still haven't saved any of my work in TIFF. Is that, because I'm just thinking about the size of those files. Um, is that still a good thing that I should maybe consider? Was that something I should consider? I would absolutely consider it. It's the highest quality version of your file you can keep, and it's going to keep all of that raw, raw data preserved inside that TIFF file. So all of your pixels are still there. It's a non-destructive form. If okay. you compress it into a JPEG, every time a, a JPEG is open and closed, you lose pixels. Yeah, yeah. So a yeah, TIFF is going to be a better archival format. Yes, they do take up a fair amount of storage space, um, but storage has gotten relatively inexpensive. And I, if it's Something that I took the time to go in and put different layers on, it's worth the storage space to me. So everybody kind of has to make that call for themselves. There is yeah. compression you can do on TIFFs. Um, if what I understand, they are not harmful. I just don't use them because it's like, I don't know. I, I yeah. Just don't. <laughs> um, so therefore, if I was to get it straight out of the camera as raw, um, mm -hmm. I always get raw in a JPEG. It's the raw that you want to edit and then after that first edit you'd save it as a tiff correct and then continue if you're going to different applications okay yep thank you thanks thanks for that angela that's good you're very welcome and as far as you know at that point do you want to save the tiff file or do you want to save the original raw if at all possible i suggest keeping both because right. editing technology changes and this is something that came up in the community in the last week um, somebody who wanted to do their edits and then get rid of their originals. Yeah. And 
while I understand that sometimes it's, you know, you're wanting to clear out clutter, you don't want to save anything that's absolutely extraneous. But if you do enjoy editing your photos, as the technology changes, I find myself going back and pulling out raw files from when I first started shooting raw 10 plus years ago. And the things that I'm able to do and bring out of those images now versus what I was able to do then, between the software changing and my skill levels improving, it's, you know, it makes it very, very interesting. I'm not going to ever go back and re-edit all of those images, but there's select ones that you go, you know what, that was a diamond in the rough there that I didn't realize yeah. I had. And so having both that original raw and your TIFF, if you decide that edited TIFF, that original edited TIFF is bad and you have a new one, delete the old one and you still have your original raw. So that's just kind I of my totally sense on that. I, and I completely agree with you. I'm a Virgo. I'm a physical hoarder and also a virtual hoarder. So <laughs> I have masses of storage, but I do agree. And I've done that myself recently. Now that I've found the newer tools, I've gone back to some old images and it's like, they just pop so much better. And I'm yeah. well more skilled nowadays. So yeah, completely agree with that statement. I don't delete anything unless it's majorly blurry or it's, you know, a, a photo of the, of the ground. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for explaining yeah. that. That's good. You're very welcome. All right. It looks like, let's see, Deb says that's an excellent practice. I'm glad you, glad you agree, Deb. <laughs> uh, let's see here. Are there any other questions today? Angela, could you show us an example of how you label your photo? That you said as you go through the various uh, developing steps you sure. just mentioned. All right, so let's go ahead and I'm just going to grab one of these sunset photos here. I'm going to go up here to photo and let's choose to do this in Photoshop. So I'm going to go here to open with and choose other. And that's going to open up my applications folder and I'm just going to scroll down and find. There we go. Uh, let's go ahead and open this in Photoshop 2023. And I'm going to edit the original raw. Let's go ahead and let that open up. And I'm going to go ahead and just quickly do um, an auto. And let's go here to white balance. Let's go ahead and choose that daylight white balance and do a quick rotate on this to straighten out the horizon. Because crooked horizons drive me crazy, even though I shoot them all the time that way. Not on purpose. So I'm going to go ahead and hit return on the keyboard to do that. So we've got a picture here. Let's say we want to take this into other applications and use those layers in Photoshop. So I'm going to say open from here. And I'm going to do a control or command J to duplicate my layer. Let me go ahead and make sure my layer is selected. There we go. And now on this layer, let's go up to filter and do, um, let's go into radiant. Let's go ahead and do radiant photo here. So this is a fun one. I don't know if you guys have had a chance to use radiant photo, but it's a really great image editor. And it does AI improvements to an image. Now, I feel like this one went a little bit over the top, made it a little bit too bright. So I can quickly go up here to, um, let's see here, I've got my Zoom tools in the way. Let me get that out of the way. Go to the quick edit here. I can pull back the strength a little bit and I can pull back the color because I feel like it over dramatized that. I also want to add a little bit of light diffusion and some depth. There we go. That's looking nice. And I'm gonna go over to the color grade tab and add a big soft vignette. And so there's my image. We can take a look here at the quick before and after. I think that's pretty nice. And hit apply. And that's gonna take us back to Photoshop. And this edit is gonna be on a new layer. So I can turn this layer off and back on. And when I wanna go back into this, I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna make this and just say radiant. So now when I reopen this TIFF file, there's my background image, which is my raw file that was edited in Adobe Camera Raw. And now I have the radiant layer. So I can always go back and say, you know what, maybe that was a little bit too much. I can pull back that opacity on that layer, just back off that edit a little bit. And maybe now what I wanna do is export this to share in our community. So from here, I'm gonna go to file and let's do place embedded. And I'm gonna add my watermark on top of this. So I have a, really cool designed photo logo that I paid for a couple of years ago. And I'm gonna go ahead and grab that file and I'm gonna place that on this image. And then we're gonna scale that down, put that over here in the corner. Oops, there we go. So let's just position that where we want it. Hit return to commit that placement. 
And then I'm going to use my blend modes here. Let's go down here to, I like the soft light. That's kind of nice. So now I have my three different layers here and I can export this here from Photoshop to share in the community. And if I don't want that, that particular layer with my, my watermark to show in my Leo, all I have to do is turn that layer off. It's still there. So when I reopen open the TIFF, I can export another copy of it with the watermark. But I want to see the version without the watermark in my Leo. So that's how I'm going to save that. From here, I'm just going to hit Save, Command or Control S. It's going to pull up that same file name with a TIFF. It's going to put it back into the folder where the original was. And then I can go ahead and hit Save. And this is the image compression we were talking about a little while ago. I choose none, but the LZW or ZIP are perfectly acceptable. And I just leave the other um, options at default and say OK. And that's going to save that change back to Mylio. And in a moment here, we'll see it pop up next to this original. There it is. So there's my original TIFF, or my uh, edited TIFF, right next to my original. Now, to jump back to the idea of the visual properties, Mylio is not going to see this as an edited image, because this is a brand new image that this is just the way it exists in Mylio's knowledge. Mylio doesn't know it was edited or cropped inside of Photoshop. It sees this as a unique image. So that is one thing that if you're trying to find those images, having some sort of, some other sort of label that you make, for instance, you can say all of my edited images from Photoshop or other apps, maybe we're going to make those blue. And then that way you can go back and you can filter to open up the rating label and flags and you can find everything you edited with that blue label. So that's how I typically do this. Thank you very much. It's very helpful. You're very welcome. All right, let's see what we got here. Taking a look at the other comments. All right, if, are there any other questions before we wrap up for today? One more question, Angie. Where was the picture of that locomotive taken? That looked really neat. Oh, I think that was in the town of Garibaldi. Um, let me go back here to the grid. It was along the Oregon coast and we were actually just pulling into town and we see this big, beautiful, steam locomotive coming right for us. Let me go ahead and I'm going to right click and show this in the live calendar because I know I have pictures of this that I took with my iPhone as well. So I'm going to flip through here and find a couple of those because then I can use Photo Explorer to find exactly where those were taken. Let's go ahead. And I've still got that folder on there. Perfect. All right, let's see here. And what I'm looking for is that little icon that pops up on top of the pictures with the pin to show that it has GPS info. And I know that I took some of these with my iPhone. <laughs> Just a matter of finding which ones they were. And I could always use our lovely filters to do that. But I believe it was a little town called Garibaldi. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> You're welcome. All right, any other questions? All right, well, I wanna thank you all for joining me today. This has been a lot of fun. Um, not only have I gotten to share with you some of the visual properties, which are really neat tools in my Leo, I got to share some of my favorite pictures from my recent trip, which is always um, a lot of fun to do as well. So I wanna wish you all a wonderful rest of your week and hope you can join us on Friday for our webinar. Thank you, Lori, for monitoring the chat and uh, sharing those links. And we will see you next time. Bye, everyone. Thanks, Angela. You're very welcome.